Welcome to the art world. This is the show where we get to know the people in this area and beyond who make up the art world. All those people that you always wondered, who are they and what do they do? So this includes artists, obviously, but also curators, teachers, conservators, dealers, collectors, all of the people that make up this strange and very small world. And today, my guest is Mark Simpson, who is the Associate Director of the Williams College Graduate Program in the History of Art, and which is located at the Clark, and over the years has served as a guest curator for some very major exhibitions of American art. And I have to say that Mark is one of the most unusual art historians in that he doesn't have a single artist that he's become expert about, but there are four, if not five, that, that rise to the top. This is, I can tell you, this is very unusual. Thomas Akins, John Singer Sargent, about whom your dissertation was written, correct? In part, yes. In part. Um, Whistler. Homer, and now Innes. Oh, no. I can't claim Innes, sadly. Oh, well. <laughs> I wish I could. But Innes is not my responsibility at the Clark this, this summer. Ah. But I did get to include him in the exhibition yes. like Breath on Glass. And That's so right. I have at least a, a, a nodding acquaintance with the man right. and admire him and his work. <clears throat> Much too modest. Much too mm. modest. Um, but today, Mark is here to talk about this amazing show that is up right now at the Clark, which celebrates the Clark's incredible holdings of Homer, about which I, I didn't know. Um, I didn't know the extent of it, actually. So tell us briefly. <laughs> <laughs> briefly. Never an easy <laughs> Right, <condition. laughs> right. How the Clark got to have all these Homers. Well, the exhibition really has two major points. One is to celebrate Homer and his achievement and to be able to appreciate the work that he did in all of the media in which he focused across the four, five decades of his active career. And are all of the Clark's holdings in the exhibition? Virtually all. Okay. Um, we have left out some of the wood engravings okay. just because of space, right. but we do have a significant number of wood engravings Indeed. up in some <laughs> interesting fashions. Right. But that celebration of Homer is very much at the fore of the, of the exhibition's purpose. But it is also to be a celebration of Robert Sterling Clark and his 40 years of actively collecting Winslow Homer's works. So that of the over 250 works by Homer in the Clark's collection, Robert Sterling Clark's activity as a collector is responsible for bringing the vast majority of them in. It, it's quite an amazing thing, especially because we think of the Clark primarily as the center of French Impressionism. <coughs> yes, and, you shocking know, just that. <laughs> off the cuff, you would think that the most major holdings were in, say, Renoir or, or and that be, period. And to be fair and to be honest, there are more Renoir oil paintings uh -huh. than there are Homer oil paintings. But if you think about how Clark collected, he generally emphasized an area of an artist's career that he liked. So for example, okay. with Renoir, the emphasis is very strongly on the early right. career. Right. With Homer, it's across the board. Yeah. And it's in all media right. in which the artist was active. Right. So it's, it's a different kind of focus. Um, yeah. And a, a focus very different than, he, as far as I know, he attached to any other of the artists whom he collected in depth. Okay. Now, can you discern, have you discerned, a preference on his part? I know he was even-handed in collecting works from all periods, but if you were to psychoanalyze Robert Sterling Clark, what would you say was his favorite? You know, it's it's really hard. Really, um, the he starts with the acquisition of some of the outdoor genre scenes, yeah. the 
two guides is, is the second oil that he buys. The first two watercolors are a good pool, Saguenay, and the eagle's nest, which show men in the Canadian mm -hmm. um, wilderness. And so you kind of think, okay, sporting and outdoors and all of that kind of stuff was the principal lure. And the last painting that he buys is the small, or the last Homer work, and one of the last of any kind that he buys is the small playing of fish ah. of an outdoorsman. So you yeah. know, you could construct a narrative arc that uh -huh. would say, ah, it's, it's the outdoor stuff, uh -huh. and everything falls within that, uh -huh. that, that per right. those parameters. And I think that's a legitimate thing to be able to say, but you read his diary entries, and he gets excited about two guides at several points. But when he sees West Point Prout's Neck for the first time, it's, my God, yeah. what a painting. Yeah. This is a marvelous. This is more exciting than anything I ever thought I could see. This is extraordinary. This is as good as anything at the Metropolitan. I never thought I'd be able to get a painting like this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh -huh. and, and the fact that he does have three pure marine paintings and then Sacco Bay, which is very close to being a pure marine, would then say, well, no, in fact, I'll I think it mm -hmm. might be the landscapes and that, that view of just right. the pure, unadulterated nature that is what is drawing him. So Right. So, yeah, complicated. It is a complicated. What and in terms <coughs> of the media, I don't think one can do it there either because he gets equally excited yeah. about oils, yeah. about watercolors, which are the things that I think most of our visitors are most excited right. by. But he has, with the activities of the Clark Art Institute after his gift, we now have all but one of the principal etchings, yeah. which is yeah. no, that's extraordinary. Right, right, right. And the vast majority of the wood engravings. Yeah. And then, you know, he late in his career, after he's decided to make a museum, he is buying things like a chromolithograph and yeah. other a, a very scholarly that, approach. Exactly, filling yeah. in gaps, yeah. it right, seems, right. so as to make now, the collection complete. Now, you have in your intro text for the exhibition the, the suggestion that Homer was, Homer himself was interested in trying to define a national art or create or establish a national art, an American art. Do you think, we can talk about Homer in a minute, <laughs> but do you think that Clark thought that he was collecting Homer as a kind of display or celebration of an American, a great American art to go along with the great French art that he had in his collection. I love that question. That's so <laughs> fine. And uh, there are three immediate responses to it. One, at several points in his diaries and in his letters, he makes a distinction. He, he talks about the great artist, greatest artists of the 19th century, and he's talking to the collector, the Boston collector Spalding at this point. And he recounts the, the conversation is going. And I told him that I thought Renoir, Corot, and Homer were the three greatest artists of the 19th okay. century. Hmm. And of ours, Homer. So uh -huh. there is certainly that, that distinction. That kind of national competition. Or, or at least, at least an, a notion of uh, an awareness that American, he separated at some level American art from the Europeans yeah. in that appraisal. Right. What's second, um, he does start his collection by buying old master, including Italian old master things. Right. And he is buying Homer at the same time as he's buying Italian old uh -huh. masters. And he so makes his first. It's not just the, the comparison to the French. Exactly. It's but not to just that. The Italian. And, and art in general, uh -huh. or Western uh -huh. art in general. Uh -huh. And then third, and what I really love, is that he buys the Homers when he is in New York, in the teens and early 20s. Uh, but he's living in France, and his great Italian works are on display in his house in Paris. Mm -hmm. And when he and Francine start to really ramp up the French 19th century collection that also is initially displayed in France. When he's back in the States and he buys a Homer or two or three or four, some of them he 
leaves here in, in apartments here. But others he marks and buys very purposely for export oh. to go back to France. Oh, and I didn't so, know that. For example, oh, how fun. We, we know that um, uh -huh. Eastern Point, when he uh -huh. buys it for the first time in 23, yeah. is marked for export uh -huh. and is sent immediately to, uh -huh. to Paris. The, when he buys Undertow, it not only does he send it directly to Paris, but he has a new frame made for it. Uh -huh. Under t Undertow has, has an interesting story about its frames. Homer sold it in a frame. The first buyer, a man named Ed Adams, Edward Adams didn't like that frame as much or wanted something special for his own collection or something that went with his collection. So he commissioned a special frame for it from a New York frame maker and that was the way the painting was sold to Clark in 1924. Clark took that frame off, and we don't know what happened to it, but had a French frame maker make a Renaissance style frame right. for undertow. I, yeah. So it's got that yeah. blue band with right, the gold right, stenciling right. around it, yeah. very much to tie in with uh -huh. the, the Italian, the Italian Renaissance there. material yeah. already in his collection. Yeah. Now, did Homer have close art artist friends? Yes. Yes, he did. Um, you don't him. think of him as no. as operating in a sort of social artistic world. I mean, I know he was he belonged to many associations. He belonged to and clubs and he associations. He certainly was well, in the art world. One of the tile clubs meetings yeah. was held at his studio. So right. I mean, there right, there right, is right. both social and professional right. interaction. But I, when you ask that question, my immediate response is why? Yes, of course, uh, John Lafarge. Oh, and. The two of them did uh -huh. share a long and decades long okay. and deep relationship and friendship mm -hmm. one with the other and mm -hmm. admiration of one another's work and challenges yeah. to one another's yeah. works. Yeah. And so I can answer yes, but I can also say it's a really legitimate question because there are wonderful records of when Homer was, for example, on the jury of the Carnegie International in Pittsburgh, the director of the Carnegie goes off to meet the jurors who are coming in by train, and he meets so-and-so, 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 and he's looking around kind of wildly, well, where's Mr. Homer? And all of them say, well, I've never, I've never seen Mr. Uh, Homer. I don't know. I oh, never saw that man. <coughs> and then he was not, Homer right? walks, on, walks forward, and that's Homer, uh -huh. some of the other artists record uh -huh. saying. So uh -huh. there is surely right, right. some separation. He was definitely in his own world. Yes. <coughs> now, in terms of the four, we'll just leave it at four, setting aside Innes for a moment, <laughs> of the four artists that you know so well and who were contemporaries themselves. And um, some of them must have met each other. No? They certainly knew of one another's Right, right. Works. But yeah, I'm just trying to think. Sergeant, Aikens and Homer might have been at the same, in the same place at the same they time. They may have, but we don't know of right, that right, right, crossing. Right. But we know that when asked, who's the greatest American artist, mm. Aikens responded, Winslow Homer. Oh, cool. We know that when Sargent came to Philadelphia, he was asked, who would you like to meet? And he said, I'd like to meet Thomas Aikens. Uh -huh. And they okay. did meet. Uh -huh. So, uh, so okay. there, there, yeah, there are yeah. tenuous ties okay. among them. But let me uh, ask you this question. Which of those four artists would you like to meet or be friends with? <laughs> oh, oh, that's good. I mean, they're all kind of quirky. They're all full of themselves. I mean, oh, there, are many, there no. are many sort of bad qualities that they have, but no, they all no, have I good disagree. qualities, they too. They all have extraordinary qualities, yeah. and they're all and very distinct individuals. Right, right. But you haven't, over the years of your study of these artists, haven't gravitated. Imagine the dinner table. Yes, exactly. Who would I want to have right, dinner with? Right, right, right. Or who you, who you would not want to have dinner with. I mean, I certainly have done that with artists I've studied. I yes. certainly would never want to come across them in a dark alley. <laughs> <laughs> That's really hard, Nancy. Oh, I, interesting. Well, I, maybe all four. All four of them would have really wonderful things to say and contribute and would make me stand up and take notice and be very, very um, pleased, I expect, 
at the end of our interview, although I'll bet I'd be deeply uncomfortable with each and every one of them <laughs> at various points. I think Whistler would have been immensely amusing and entertaining, and I would have walked away knowing that I was, if at yeah. all found worthy, <laughs> I was going to be the butt of some wonderful <laughs> joke that went on right. later on. Aikens, I think, would have been very sincere, very earnest, mm -hmm. and I think that would have been a really engaging series of opportunities to plumb his mind and yeah. see how how he, that what, he what was his thinking. priorities were, right, right, what right. what was going on in that. I, I what to my mind very deeply earnest and sincere and truth seeking man. With Homer, it would have been. I think very hard to get past that first initial barrier because I understand that as soon as he knew you were an art historian or right, part right, of the art world, right. there was this kind of yeah. protective barrier that went up and I've, right. I got a feeling that we would have right. stood at cross purposes right. one to the other and it would not have really worked out that way. And with Sargent, it would have just been funny and wonderful yeah. and, I, and because of my work on <coughs> my dissertation, it right. was on Iraq him on in a group. Right. And right. so I can imagine that it would have been yeah. delightful, engaging entertainment. Henry James might well have been with him and so I wouldn't have had to say anything. There I could have just go. been talked at and it would have been <laughs> wonderful. And Sargent could have played the piano and it would be a splendid evening for us all. <laughs> wonderful. Well, Mark, thank you so much for evoking that art world for us. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you so much for letting me be here. And thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you around the art world. Mm -hmm.